Hi, good afternoon. This is Greg Lois, and thanks for joining me today to talk about occupational exposure and repetitive use injury claims in New Jersey. Uh, this is kind of a uh, big benchmark uh, webinar for me. Uh, we've been doing webinars uh, for five years now, and it was actually four years ago uh, last week that I founded this firm. Uh, pretty exciting. Uh, last week we had a little party here. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us. And I also want to thank everyone who's helped make this firm a success. We started this firm, just a handful of attorneys started with me. Uh, now we're up to 27 attorneys defending claims in New York and New Jersey. Uh, big practice with almost 50 employees. And I just want to thank everyone who comes to these webinars, who asks questions, and who have uh, been with us as we've been through some of our big changes and expansions over the years. All right, so let's get into this topic. Today we're talking about occupational exposures, repetitive use injuries. I'm going to talk about exposure claims in general in the New Jersey context. I'm going to talk about plant closings. Uh, in fact, we're involved in one heavily right now. I'm also going to talk about New Jersey's law, which changed in July to expand the availability of occupational exposure claims for firefighters and public safety workers in New Jersey. Uh, I'm going to talk about our standard defense practices and really best practices in our opinion. I'm going to talk about jurisdictional doctrines which affect exposure in this jurisdiction. And I'm going to try to give as much practical advice as I possibly can during this period or, or during this uh, presentation. Now, I would ask that you ask me as many questions as you possibly can. You type them into that little screen that you see there. Uh, they pop up for me, and I will uh, try to answer as many questions as I can at the end. It makes it so much more fun if people ask a lot of questions. Uh, so definitely bring with to uh, this any questions you have. I'd love the questions to be about occupational exposure claims, your repetitive use claims, or your public safety worker claims. Uh, but if you don't have any of those, just bring any questions. I'll try to answer as many as I can. I do try to keep these webinars to 15 to 20 minutes. I'll answer the questions at the end, and I'll never say your last name. I'll just say your first name, read your question for the entire audience, and then answer it the best I can. All right, so ask questions, type them in as we go. Uh, let's talk about occupational exposure claims in New Jersey just in general. Yeah, uh, we have them, uh, both repetitive use style claims, uh, environmental exposure claims, chemical exposure claims, uh, and of course, uh, stress and uh, psychiatric illness claims. Uh, the only thing the claimant has to argue is that the injury or the occupational uh, exposure arose out of in the course of the employment and that there was something peculiar to or characteristic to the employment uh, that uh, caused their uh, injury. Now, uh, the standard in New Jersey for the claimant is preponderance of the evidence. If you're asking me what that means, it really means more than nothing. Uh, they do have to present some sort of objective medical or scientific proof as to causation, as to exposure, and the burden is on the petitioner with, of course, one loophole, which I'll get to next. Uh, our statute specifically states in it that the natural uh, uh, aging process, uh, natural normal degeneration and deterioration is not covered. Uh, and so, of course, one of our main defenses is going to be arguing that there is no occupational exposure or injury here. It really is just the natural effects of aging uh, that is now uh, resulting in this claim. Uh, our New Jersey uh, courts have consistently said that normal work stress is not compensable, and they've also said that every job involves sitting. So if your argument is that you became 9,000 pounds because you sit all day, well, everybody sits all day. Uh, you, there's nothing peculiar or characteristic of any one particular employment uh, that would let those kinds of claims be found compensable. All right. Uh, of course, this is New Jersey, and so we have recently created a loophole for public employees. Uh, if you're ever wondering what state you want to be a public employee in, New Jersey is probably the one. We've got the most uh, uh, lucrative benefit pension systems available, and of course, uh, we want to protect our first responders who have become some sort of special class. Uh, in July of 2019, so only a few months ago, uh, we passed yet another new law stating that if you are a uh, first responder, public safety worker, uh, it's presumed that any cancer you develop 
uh, is the result of your employment. Now, this is uh, incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, encompassing. Uh, New Jersey, every little town, and there's over 700 little towns, has a volunteer fire department, volunteer police auxiliaries, et cetera. They are all shoehorned in under this. And it essentially says that firefighters ages 75 or under who develop any kind of cancer and who have served as a firefighter in any capacity for seven years, any seven years, uh, it'll be presumed that their cancer uh, is work-related. Uh, if that sounds insane, it's because it absolutely is insane. Uh, there is the argument uh, that we can overcome this presumption and we'll have to fight or show why things like prostate cancer, which is the most common cancer uh, in men, is not work-related. But uh, everyone uh, in the public employment space, uh, if you represent or insure public entities, uh, you should be scared out of your mind about this. In addition, uh, this new law says that any communicable diseases are going to be presumed to be compensable for any first-line uh, medical workers, anyone working in a public medical facility. This would include anything like an EMT, volunteer ambulance corps, anything like that. Uh, so this is very expansive and includes a lot of stuff. Uh, Non-firefighters do still need to show exposure to some kind of chemical in order to be found uh, compensable. Uh, however, uh, this is going to be likely an easy burden for them to meet. They're just going to claim they were exposed to something, and the burden is then going to fall to the employer to show that, nope, they absolutely were not. Uh, the thing I want to mention about this is this also applies to retired firefighters and goes back 20 years. So some of my public employers, you're going to see these claims coming out of the woodwork. Someone who's now been living in Florida for 15 years, they retired at age 50, uh, is going to bring these firefighter claims alleging that whatever cancer they have, any kind of condition they have, uh, is going to be now found compensable. Um, the uh, medical uh, authority that has been cited to you uh, is... Uh, the World Health Organization, which we all know is a clowny joke, and we can expect there to be an, a tremendous amount of argument about which uh, cancers are going to be work-related. Again, uh, there's lots of literature out there that finds really basic cancers that are found uh, in um, the normal population, for example, prostate cancer, somehow related to firefighting activities. Well, really, uh, there are very weak causal links, and defense counsel and medical prof and sorry, risk professionals are going to have to be prepared to defend these claims. So let's talk about uh, preventing some of these exposure claims. And I want to start with prevention, and then we're going to talk more about how we actually defend them uh, and what we can do to get aggressive with these kinds of claims. Uh, first, uh, let's look around the workplace. Let's concentrate on improving ergonomics, particularly in the repetitive use space. Let's look at safety. Let's look at uh, personal protective devices. Let's look at masks, respirators, breathing, uh, any kind of equipment we can deploy to mitigate some of these risks. Um, let's come up with plans. Uh, New Jersey, in particular, has a uh, has spate of plant closings. Why is this? Well, and guess what? If you're the highest tax state, highest regulated state, people are going to move their businesses out of the state as fast as they possibly can. Uh, New York and New Jersey both have the same experience. Well, uh, under the uh, uh, the Warren Act, which states that if you are going to do large layoffs, you do have to let your population know. Uh, we all know that that just alerts plaintiff and petitioner uh, attorneys to start circling their uh, vans uh, uh, around the uh, employer premises and plants and try to sign up as many of the employees as they possibly can. And heaven help you if you're in a union uh, situation because every single one of your employees in the plant closing scenario is going to go uh, to their friendly attorney at law and you're going to see a spate uh, of occupational exposure claims. They're going to allege uh, that as a result of uh, heat and vibration and doing their normal job, lifting, carrying, they now have permanent orthopedic occupational injuries. You're going to see hearing loss claims. Every single person in the plant uh, will be going to their friendly uh, audiologist and finding that they have uh, sensorineural hearing loss. You'll see occupational exposure pulmonary ventilatory claims. Everyone all of a sudden will have a ventilatory defect and they'll be claiming that their lungs are defective from working in this terrible smoky environment. So please, if you think are contemplating a plant layoff, you're contemplating laying off 25 or more employees, closing a plant location, that's the moment we should really be focusing on getting our documentation together and getting our information together. Um, you can do post-employment testing in New Jersey, and that would be uh, health and medical testing. That's going to become incredibly important in our public employer context. 
where I'm going to be encouraging my public employers, when you hire a new person, uh, let's be doing this to make sure that when they bring their cancer claim 40 years from now, we knew what the baseline was. And certainly, uh, with particularly the new uh, public safety law that just went into effect in July, uh, there's no uh, protection in there for employers about pre-existing conditions or illnesses. In other words, if you hire an employee, they come aboard as a public safety employee or a volunteer firefighter, uh, they already have cancer, let's say. Uh, guess what? Now you've bought it, uh, unless you've done some uh, post-employment testing to weed that out and confirm that that is a prior pre-existing condition, you're going to be stuck with it. So we have to get aggressive about that. Record keeping is key in defending occupational exposure claims. Uh, oftentimes, uh, and particularly in the plant closing context, I go to the employer and I say, well, this person alleges that they were in this smoky, terrible environment. It was horrible. I couldn't even see the worker standing next to them and breathing in all the fumes from all the soldering that was going on in the welding. They couldn't see anybody. And they were wearing masks. And all, you know, they tell these crazy stories. And then my employer turns to me and says, Greg, uh, we've won uh, the OSHA Gold Award for the last 10 years for the cleanest workplace in all of New Jersey. And I said, that's great. That's the kind of information I need to go into court and to challenge their experts with. So please, record keeping, documentation, and particularly things like our OSHA awards, our ergonomic awards, uh, our internal studies, our uh, occupational ergonomics, our, our own industrial hygienists, any information that you could provide to defense, provide to your risk professional that's going to help us defend the case is going to be absolutely very useful. All right, next, uh, they've now brought their claim and we're defending this for you. What are we doing on our behalf? What's defense counsel gonna do when these come to us? Uh, our position is that you need to weaponize discovery and really go after anything that's pre-existing and absolutely not related to the employment. So we're gonna do the full panoply of discovery that is available in this jurisdiction. And guess what? There's a lot of stuff you can do in New Jersey. You can't do depositions, but you can demand that they reveal to you all of their medical treatment that they claim is now related to your claim. You can serve interrogatories. You can serve custom interrogatories. You can serve form interrogatories. Uh, the New Jersey uh, uh, Division of Workers' Compensation publishes form occupational exposure interrogatories with a number of questions for the petitioner to answer. Uh, stating they either were or were not exposed, who they had treatment with, when it manifested, all of those types of things. Um, we will serve them releases so we can get medical records. You want independent medical records from their treating providers directly. Uh, the employer should be turning over the personnel file of the alleged injured worker. We want to look through that entire personnel file. We want to see exactly what their job description was. And I want to look at any employer health records, any leave requests, medical requests, uh, anything that went on uh, from a health perspective. Of course, we're going to go through uh, their uh, uh, Social Security earnings report, which we're going to obtain from Social Security to find out if there was any uh, concurrent employment anywhere else and I'm going to talk about that in a second as to why we'd want to do that and I also want to make sure that we are truly the last employer on the risk at the time of manifestation exposure or disability so uh, last thing is don't forget you get the opportunity to cross-examine the petitioner now we can't depose the petitioner prior to their testimony at trial but we do get the opportunity to cross-examine them all right Let's talk about defending these exposure claims and jurisdictionally, what kind of legal defenses do we have? Well, you've got a statute of limitations. Unfortunately, uh, it's so weak and has so many holes in it that you could drive a tractor trailer through it. And that is, the statute of limitations is two years. Uh, the petitioner must bring their occupational exposure claim within two years. But when the two years starts is when they knew or should have known that they had the actual injury. So uh, we've had uh, cases that we've won and there's case law in New Jersey on winning where the petitioner was telling their personal physician, yeah, I've got lung cancer and you know what? It's because uh, they've had asbestos throughout this building I've been in for years and years and years. They then wait, uh, wait three or four years and then file their workers' compensation claim. Well, the fact that they had told their own medical treatment provider in advance, hey, by the way, I think the reason I have this condition now is because of this uh, thing that's been in, in the workplace. And they said it years and years and years ago, more than two years ago, the employer was successful on a statute of limitations defense, right? Because the employer is going to be prejudiced by that. Um, notice is still a defense. If the petitioner believes that there has been uh, exposure and injury, uh, they have a 90-day requirement to provide uh, uh notice to the employer, in my experience, uh, this defense is extraordinarily weak. Um, the last exposure or bond doctrine defense is 
it's not really a defense, but it is a doctrine that applies. There is case law in New Jersey that says where multiple employers may have contributed to the overall exposure, and you can't pin it down to which employer actually exposed the petitioner. And I want you to think of circumstances like asbestosis, uh, occupational uh, breathing claims, um, noise claims, so hearing loss claims. The Bond Doctrine, which comes from a case called Bond versus Blue Rose Ribbon, simply states that the last employer on the risk at the time of manifestation or disability is the employer uh, or carrier, really, uh, who is responsible for paying for the loss. Uh, there is generally no apportionment to the prior periods. They all get out uh, unless there can be a finding or showing of actual manifestation or actual exposure in a prior period. What this really means is if you're the last employer and in the plant closing context you typically are, really be very cautious about uh, the fact that there might be an, a prior employment with actual exposure. Uh, I had a case in which uh, we represented a facility, uh, all the security guards, the facility closed, security guards all bring their claims and they claim asbestosis uh, exposure. Well, uh, in that case, uh, the asbestos had been remediated 10 years before my client, my carrier, uh, insured this employer, which meant because there could not have possibly been any exposure during our period of employment, we can't possibly have any liability and it went back to a prior period of coverage. So there are things to be done here with this last exposure. Next, defending occupational exposure claims in particular often involve weak, lame, weirdo, bizarre science that makes no sense. In this jurisdiction in New Jersey, there used to be a doctor who uh, used to opine about his single molecule theory. He used to state that if there was even a single molecule of asbestos anywhere in the workplace, anybody's plural asbestos 50 years later was absolutely related to that. In other words, great leaps are being made uh, and between uh, what kind of exposures there actually are and then what kind of medical causation is being found by these expert physicians. And believe me, Petitioner's Council are selecting very specific expert physicians who are going to render a report that says, of course, their cumulative workplace exposures led to these alleged conditions. Uh, Defense Council uh, needs to be prepared to challenge weak science in this respect. Um, exposure facts help us do that. That's why I was alluding to earlier saying, hey, do some record keeping. Uh, key to the defense of many of these cases is finding out when the abatement, asbestos removals occurred. Uh, any kind of records we have about actual noise volume in the actual employment. Uh, what kind of testing have we done? What kind of record keeping have we done? What kind of information do we have about MSDS, the material safety data sheets of all the materials that are in the workplace? Uh, make sure we hold on to those, even in a plant closing context, because we're going to need them later to defend that these things were not present in the workplace. Finally, I can't stress enough the importance of our own IME. Our own independent medical evaluator is going to be oftentimes the only voice of reason in this case who's going to argue against these bizarre non-scientific causation statements made by uh, the claimant's physicians. Uh, there are many reported cases in New Jersey about causation and about the weight or objectiveness of the information provided by the relevant experts. Uh, there are uh, case law in New Jersey, for example, regarding employees who claimed that they went into their own employer's tunnel of, on several occasions, couldn't give a very specific number, and said that exposure to uh, car exhaust uh, caused them to develop an occupational condition years later. Really, really weak statements on uh, exposure and then causal relationship are oftentimes accepted by the workers' compensation court, and it's really up to us on the defense side uh, to present the better science, the better information, and oftentimes that will mean the results of uh, uh, medical studies, uh, any kind of um, epidemiological studies, et cetera, to disprove or discredit uh, the claimant's uh, statements. All right. Uh, the trial of exposure claims. Uh, these are cases that frequently do go to trial because they are outlandish, subjective complaints of exposure and need to be met in court. Uh, first of all, we need to challenge the subjectivity of these exposures. Oftentimes, these are just simply bare assertions made by the claimant. I was exposed to X, Y, and Z with absolutely no proof. Next, uh, we need to present lifestyle and, and investigation information that we've obtained. 
uh, the asbestos claim or the lung cancer claim, uh, the Barrett's esophagus or esophageal cancer claim, someone who alleges I worked in a, in a chemical plant and I've now developed all these panoplies of cancers. And then we discover by looking into their lifestyle that they're an active smoker. Uh, those are things that we can use to mitigate those claims and certainly position them for compromise or release. Uh, don't forget that the uh, defense of these claims will involve the cross-examination of the petitioner's expert, and that's really an opportunity for us to work with our expert behind the scenes and make sure that defense counsel is ready to go with very incisive cutting questions to challenge the petitioner's expert's opinions. Uh, it is also important that we educate the court as to existing scientific and medical standards. Uh, in the past, uh, some pretty weak science was passed off as uh, proof of causation, but that really needs to be challenged today, uh, particularly with our more up-to-date epidemiological information and certainly better imaging, medical information that we have today. All right, uh, that's how we try these cases. I want uh, the audience to know that occupational exposure claims are winnable. Uh, and that there are strategies that you can employ to reduce your exposure in these claims. All right, now it's time for some live questions and answers. I am gonna go over here to the questions and I hope people have been typing them in. Okay, uh, first question. Jill asked an interesting question. Uh, now, uh, I guess it takes the word occupational exposure quite literally. And she asked me the question, Greg, what about insect or animal bites? Yes, there is case law in New Jersey that finds insect bites to be compensable if they are related to the nature of employment. So for example, uh, a tick bite has been found compensable in New Jersey, uh, where the person worked as a groundskeeper uh, for a uh, uh, country club, a golf country club. In that context, the tick bite and the resultant Lyme's disease and treatment was found to be compensable. However, I've also defended cases in which spider bites or insect bites were claimed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we found out that there was pre-existing pre-morbid history uh, of examples of things like diabetes or cellulitis. And really what it was was someone trying to pass off a skin condition uh, that complicated by the pre-morbid status of diabetes as something work-related. And we said, look, in this job, there's no proof that this, the bites actually occurred. There's nothing peculiar to this employment that would expose you to spiders. So for that reason, the case is going to be denied and disputed. Um, okay, let me look at the next question. Uh, Jim just says, hey, congrats on the fourth anniversary of the firm. Thanks for all you do. Uh, to help educate us in the claims community. Jim, it's my pleasure. I really think that uh, one of the reasons we've had such great support over the years is because we really try uh, to share our knowledge and share what we're doing here. Uh, to me, it's really important and it's part of our overall mission. Uh, all right, uh, that's it for questions or comments. Jim, I really appreciate that last one. I can't tell you how proud and happy I am of the group that I'm working with here. I can truly say that I've been doing workers' comp for uh, 19 years now. And I'm working with the best group I've ever worked with, the best team, uh, best support, best staff, uh, and certainly the best clients. So thanks to everyone. Next Monday, we're going to talk about IMEs. Uh, we're also in my office uh, going to have a few independent medical evaluators to come and train our attorneys. We're actually shutting down on the third Friday of the month next month. We're doing all day training for attorneys, practicing cross-examination and getting best practices from both a board certified orthopedic surgeon and a board certified pain uh, treater. Uh, I'm gonna come back here the, on that Monday, so the, the next couple days later and uh, share everything I learned with you. All right, thanks again for joining us. I hope everybody has a great week. See you next month.